Hello, this is Jeffrey Fox, Unit 2, Lesson 9, Big Data Applications and Analytics course in the Data Science Curriculum. And here we're going to look at uh, one of the examples done in detail in this course, which is the discovery of the Higgs particle with the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And this, remember, is the course motivation um, unit. Here we have um, a um, mosaic of information about CERN, and it comes from an article that uh, I, I wrote with Tony Hay and Andrew Pleffen called Where Does All the Data Come From? The link to that is up here. So here we have a picture of CERN. Well, actually, it's sort of su it's superimposed on a map. It's really underground CERN, it runs around in two circles. And those particles are collided. And they are, the results of the collisions are, um, are recorded by an apparatus. And there are these different experiments, ATLAS, ALICE, LHCB, and CMS are the four major experiments. They all have apparatus uh, like this, although ATLAS and CMS, I think, are a little bigger than the others. And you can see it's enormous. Even though these particles are tiny, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters in size, to actually um, measure them and, to <coughs> and um, study them, you need enormous apparatus. Because so what happens is these protons uh, collide, and then the results of the collision are um, fly out, and then they're measured in complicated devices, which take charged particles and measure the uh, tracking of these charged particles. This is what you see here when you see these um, tracks. These come from taking chambers, which have looked at the um, uh, what happens when charged particles go through depositing um, in, uh, their tracks in, the, in these chambers. And then there are other things such as uh, so-called um, calorimeters, which measure energies when people hit them and think about photons or other particles hit them. And so these events here are measured on an enormous scale, even though the particles are tiny. And uh, that's just what it takes to produce an accurate measurement, because unless you made it this big, you will not be able to detect the 100 or so particles that came out in this event. When I did this field, we only produced tens of particles per event. Now we're producing hundreds of particles per event, because we're at higher energy. And as they bash each other harder, they'll produce more particles. And we have the same number here, which is possibly not so accurate, of 15 petabytes per year. It's in that broad range, whether it's a 10 or, or 40, I don't quite certain. Notice this um, tunnel here is 27 kilometers, 17 miles in circumference. So this is pretty big. It crosses uh, Switzerland and France, probably deliberately to emphasize the great uh, um, collaboration called the European Union. And um, you have the LHC computing grid, which actually probably has more than 200,000 cores arranged in a three level structure, which we'll depict in the actual uh, details of this course, where the lowest level is the accelerator itself. It probably processes, uh, I don't know, 25% of the data. Then you have a second level down, which are the national facilities. Um, so a place like the US probably has several tier one centers. Uh, there are big, big DOE uh, labs such as Fermilab, Brookhaven, and so on. And then tier two, um, even Indiana University has a tier two system for the so called Atlas experiment. Each experiment has separate infrastructures. And um, so here it has here seven tier one, the C for, there's one stage for CMS, which is one of the bigger ones, and 50 tier two. So this is some enormous enterprise. And you're meant to detect, looked at all these particles here and look for signatures of things that are interesting. This is an interesting event, because there's a lot of the information going out sideways, which is very unusual. Normally, information just goes back and forth, because these particles are going in, which collide, are going like this. And the what they produce also goes in the same direction. To produce something sideways is very unusual. And it's this typical, the so-called trigger to be able to detect events that are interesting to look at. 
This data analysis is very sophisticated and again requires theoretical understanding as to what might be interesting. You're not just taking all data, you're looking at data with a very clear bias, which is biased by what you think. And here's a typical um, accelerator. You can see the tunnel. We saw the tunnel was depicted for CERN. This particular um, a tunnel is from uh, Brookhaven with a so called uh, heavy ion collider. It's accelerating not protons, but heavy ions. And this one is only 2.4 miles long. I remember the sun was uh, 27 kilometers. And um, this one's somewhat smaller. It's not as high energy. The particles are bigger. And it's probing different things. It's, produce, it's probing the, the sort of gooey things that happen when lots of particles collide with lots of particles, a real mess. And maybe in that real mess, something dramatic happens. All right, here's the typical results of the experiments, and we'll describe how to analyze this type of data. There's a simple so-called histogram, which is, the no, which is basically the number of events of a certain type. These are already being selected to be of the type that uh, looks interesting. This is from the Atlas experiment, one of the two big experiments. And uh, you have here, um, you're looking at the so-called two photon decay of the Higgs particle. Um, and so you're detecting two photons probably going out sideways, one in this way, one in that way. And uh, then you look at that, calculate the mass, and you hope to see a peak. Because Unfortunately, you can get two photons going out sideways from various reasons, either because they weren't actually photons or just because they're background events, which produce two things. One sends a photon that way, the other one sends a photon that way, and really those photons aren't correlated. And this is the background here, this smooth curve, which you determine from the data. And here you have a bump, which is the Higgs. And this is the model. You produce a model called smooth background plus bump, where the bump is a particle. And then you fit that bump to find the so-called width of the Higgs, which is dominated in this case by measurement errors, and the mass of the Higgs, which is a real measurement. Because uh, um, even if you do measurement errors, the mean of this uh, Gaussian is going to be uh, at the actual mass. And so you, that's some. Um, it's not distorted by the by uh, errors. So uh, this is the field, as I mentioned, uh, which I studied in, in days gone by. And ran, I remember in a class in 1964, I was sitting there wanting to trying to decide what to do my research in. This is my last year as an undergraduate, um, and um, this professor. Um, told me that a bump was a particle. Actually, this professor was interesting. He left the university to enter church, and uh, he got interested in religion. Uh, people like Newton also did things like that. It's a strange characteristic of uh, being a professor. And he told me this was a particle. And I thought that was an uh, incredible concept, that a bump could be a particle. Actually, it's sort of trivial. It's just the way it's, the, it's not really the particle. It's the way the particle is measured. But I didn't understand that. And I listened to all the other professors describing uh, superconductivity and uh, fluid flow and stars and things. And this concept that bumps for particles was to me the most amazing concept. So I decided to do my PhD in this field of particle physics. Actually, later on in my life, I found computing was moving faster than physics. Also, I found that physics had you know, huge size, uh, namely the Atlas has 3,000 physicists. When I did physics experiments, we only had 30 in the experiment. Uh, but I could already see the trend and that it was going to get bigger and bigger. And I preferred uh, things that move faster and um, were done by somewhat smaller teams because then one was lighter weight and uh, one was maybe doing a more individual. Uh, contribution. Uh, so this is this Atlas uh, experiment, which we saw a picture of. It's 45 meters long, the experimental apparatus. We saw it in diameter, 25 meters. We saw the people, very small compared to the apparatus. And it's pretty heavy, 7,000 tons. Notice the US was going to build the equivalent of the Large Hadron Collider. They spent $2 billion in Texas. 
and canceled it in 1993 after it was approved in 1983. That was all part of the um, recession which happened around 1990 and led to re-examination of how to spend money. The CERN was not canceled, partly because in the European Union it's almost impossible to cancel something because you have to get all the countries to agree. So things tend to be more sure in Europe and uh, move uh, in a more clear fashion. Uh, but of course, there's not so much innovation in Europe. Here's some so that if you go to Google Scholar, you can see some of the papers I wrote at that time. Richard Feynman is a famous physicist. Rick Field was my postdoc. He was the brother of Sally Field, who you may know as an actress. And because we all lived near Hollywood and things like that, or in Pasadena, California, the center of the world. And here was a paper which was describing how to make models, theories, and they may have what happened in, in this type of event, which you are now seeing at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, Richard Feynman I know it was very influential on me. He taught me a lot of things about how to do scientific research. He told me when you build a model, um, you keep the model fixed and explore it. What you never do, he said, was when you take your model is to keep changing the model to make it fit the data better and better. Because then you just uh, just change. Then you have to fix a model, explore it. Do some deductions, improve the model, take that improved model, and examine it for a while, and make changes and so on. That was why I still remember that lesson. And here is a paper with uh, Stephen Wolfram, who was a student at Caltech at the time, now, now famous for Wolfram Alpha and Mathematica. And this was some work we did, which is very highly cited. You can see here even today. It was produced uh, in the late 70s. But actually, was only used in 2004 <laughs> because uh, its main application was these large types of events produced at E plus E minus, or most importantly, in E plus E minus accelerators, and to look for a peculiar, uh, unusual events. It was a way, uh, an ingenious way of trying to do that. So that was a data analysis technique. You could call it a data mining or data analytics technique, and um, that was 1978, December, um, December the 4th. All right, that was my past. We move on. This is why I gave up physics. This is just the A's and the B's of the Atlas collaboration. So you can see this particular paper is dominated by the list of collaborators. Amazing. So. You can go on and see all the other collaborators. But it's an incredible feature of science, is the enormously large teams. Uh, sort of important but daunting fact. Thank you. So that's the, uh, end, of the uh, end of this particular lesson. Thank you.